Okay, uh, welcome back. So, some of you have heard back from me already on your project proposals. If you haven't yet, you'll hear it very soon. Um, I gotta say, I'm really excited about the projects. I think uh, there's gonna be a lot of extremely cool projects um, this year. I think, um, as much as you guys complain about it, I think the ability to, to have the dynamics uh, for you and some of the tools um, available already for you to get started just means that the complexity of the projects can go up and it's going to be awesome. You guys are going to love the final project presentations. Um, I'm really excited. So, uh, and if you haven't heard back from me, you'll hear back from me um, soon. So, today we're going to start the next, uh, the next topic, which is uh, feasible motion planning. We've been alluding to it for a few uh, lectures now. Okay, so um, let me just make sure we have perspective since there's so many um, algorithms and ideas kicking around in the class, right? So we've already talked about a, a number of approaches to, to motion planning. Certainly, um, dynamic programming uh, was is an approach to motion planning where we gave a few analytical solutions like LQR in special cases and the minimum time in special cases, one case. <laughs> um, and then we talked about numerical algorithms based on graph search, right? The other big version of, of feasible of motion planning we've used in class has been trajectory optimization. Okay, so um, you know these tools uh, will solve an, op an optimal motion plan uh, on the for the discretized system, right? But the big objection to them, well, there's the two, were that the discretization, uh, the errors could be hard to bound, right? It was hard to, to say something about the continuous system, and that it didn't, it didn't scale well to uh, higher dimensional systems. Doesn't scale. Um, these trajectory optimizations do scale well. Um, but they're local solutions. And what that means in the context of today is that they're not guaranteed to give you an answer, right? <clears throat> so for instance, if I'm planning for my robot that's operating in a maze, I don't know, give myself a simple maze here. Let's say my robot is here and the goal is here, okay, and I've got obstacles all around me. If my trajectory optimization is currently considering trajectories over here and it's trying to pull itself towards the goal, it's very likely that it will, it will not return an answer even though an answer exists. It will just say, sorry, I failed, right? So the goal for today is to come up with algorithms that will return 
a solution if it exists and will potentially scale to big complex systems, but we're going to give something up in the process. The thing we're going to give up is the optimal. Okay, So the, when I say feasible motion planning, the, what that implies to me is, is that it's, it's a, as, a, as a contrasting against optimal motion planning. We're going to try to find any old solution if it exists, but I'd like to have an algorithm that is complete in the sense that it will find a solution if it exists. Is the out of focus projector crippling or is it okay? It's okay? Yeah. So the example that you gave, um, doesn't that have to do with the, uh, the length of the planning rod rather than the solution being missing? Even if I was allowing it to stretch in time, um, you know, you could imagine even more, you know, trapped solutions. But my, you know, incremental changes to this, uh, this trajectory are going to run into a constraint and won't likely back up and come around and come over here. The other way I've drawn it before is that if I've got a, a trajectory that's currently going left around the obstacle and the right answer is to go right around the obstacle, it's unlikely that trajectory optimization is going to jump from one to the other. Right? Simply because it's, it, it's, it pictures that as a constraint violation and won't try to look at certain solutions over there. Yeah? It will find a trajectory if it exists, and we'll, there's there's people that have been working on putting optimality back into these frameworks. But initially, we're not going to worry about it being a locally optimal. It's not going to have any objective function except for I'll write down the exact problem formulation, but just find a path if it exists from the start to the goal. Okay, and the the. The idea here is that we're going to do motion planning uh, as a search problem. All right, so, so let me give you that problem formulation. So um, So let's say we have our dynamical system, x dot equals f of x u, or if, it's, if, we are, if we're willing to live with the discretization, it can be easier to write things down as the discrete, sorry, only time discretization, but continuous x and u, and we can write down the discrete time dynamics like this. We're given some initial state. And we have some goal state or goal region. And I would like to find a, a trajectory, if it one, a finite trajectory. Which, which satisfies those um, if it exists. The thing I'm leaving out is any objective function, saying that I'm going to somehow have preference between there. And we can work them back in, but the first idea is let's just leave them out. Okay. So the algorithms we'll talk about here are going to potentially scale to complex robots. Um, potentially being giving some guarantees of completeness, but we're going to give up certainly global optimality and, and we'll think about what it, what it means for local optimality. There's a great book on these topics. Planning Algorithms by Steve Laval. It's 
It's actually free online. And Steve will actually be here soon giving a robotics talk uh, in a few weeks to tell us what he's been doing in, at Oculus Rift. Uh, OK, so uh, let's, let's just give, me, give you a little perspective. So I say motion planning is going to be a search problem. Actually, so um, one of the algorithms we'll talk the most about uh, today was, come, was um, originated by Steve Laval and James Kuffner. Uh, James is now at Google Robotics. He's, he's just announced that he's replacing Andy Rubin at Google Robotics. Um, so these guys have done very well. Um, I, I remember seeing a great talk by James uh, when I was starting out where he came in and he was going to talk about his robot motion planning algorithm. And he gave this introduction, which was, um, you know, artificial intelligence is search, right? This is sort of, this AI is a search problem. And really, there's a long history of people um, talking about AI as search. Um, going, if you date back to, to um, some of the original problems in artificial intelligence, like Samuel's checker players and, uh, and, and the chess players, like Deep Blue, there were theorem proving algorithms. Um, there's you know IBM Watson. All the all these there's sort of all these uh, big ideas where we're going to. We're going to say that intelligence is really just the ability to do search very effectively. And um, there's lots of incarnations of that. But it, it came down to having very effective graph search algorithms. That's what made it possible for a human, for a computer to play checkers initially, as well as a, as well as a human. Eventually chess, as the search algorithms got a little bit better and the computers got a lot better, right? And, and, and the like, right? So there's a long history of um, of graph search. Right, so I talked about um, dynamic programming as one graph search algorithm, which, um, which basically solved the search problem by very efficiently computing the cost to go for every possible state simultaneously. That was the big trick, right? But there's a, a whole literature of algorithms that do graph search. Um, I mean, the problem is with DP is that you, it doesn't scale to do that for every possible um, state when, this, when the number of states gets very, very large. So there's a really nice question. Is, can I find the shortest path from the start to the goal of an enormous graph without visiting every possible node in the graph? Right? And there's a lot of good algorithms that can do that. And I just sort of want to pay them lip service here. But there's algorithms like um, A star, you might have heard of, uh, which use heuristics and pruning to be able to search. and find even optimal solutions um, but without visiting every node. And there's a few key ideas in that world we'll ask you about, um, at least one of them on the problem set. Other things you'll see in the robotics literature, D star is a, is a variation of A star that can run even if your robot's moving around and the world, your sense of the world changes, you can dynamically replan. A star type solutions. Um, but there's just, you know, I want to call out to a, a rich literature of graph search algorithms that are based on an idea of heuristically exploring the space and, and trying to find a path to the goal without visiting every possible part of state space. Okay, we want to do the same thing, but, but for me, for control type problems in robotics, um, the problem with these algorithms is they're always living on the discretized system, the, the state discretization. They always live on a graph. And we want something um, for our robotics
We need something that lives in a more continuous, more natively in a continuous space. Okay, so um, one of the ideas that Steve and, and, and James had early on, uh, remember, you remember what my projection was of the, of the discretized states, right? If I, if I have some state space, x1, x2, and I built some graph you know, of, of, of states here, right? I built some graph on top of my state space. One of the complaints that I had initially was that if I, if I actually look at feasible control inputs, you know, they don't necessarily land directly on one of the nodes. So that discretized system is always an approximation, and it was hard to, to reason about that, right? So one of the early ideas um, that came online for the more natively continuous systems was let's build the graph. We'll still build a graph, but we'll build it sort of dynamically. We'll let the system, we'll sample from feasible points on the, um, you know, feasible actions, and we'll just let it grow dynamically, right? So instead, let's think of an algorithm that starts off with a single node, and I'll, and I'll sample, I'll pick a random action, u, and wherever I land, I'll build a new, a new state, right? I'll sort of organically build my, my graph. based on random samples. Right, so that was a really, that's a really nice idea. So, and you can imagine if you want to just keep building up your graph, then maybe you'll, maybe an algorithm could be, I'll just pick a random node on my graph, pick a random action, grow it. Next time I'll pick this, a different random node, I'll pick a random action, grow it. And one of the nice things about this is I'll end up with a, a set of nodes that are only feasible. They're always feasible points. It's, I've always got, the, whatever trajectory I have is a feasible trajectory, and it'll eventually try, you know, if I, if I pick something at random every time, I'll eventually have tried every possible action from every possible state, and I'll get some graph that maybe can find a path to a goal if it exists, right? And really, if these all were originated from a single node, then maybe the graph is actually a tree. And that trivial algorithm has some nice properties, right? It's not only is it is it um, always feasible, you'll and you'll eventually. Um, you know, every, every path here is a feasible path, but also it's it's a complete planner, probabilistically complete, is the is the sort of official way to say it. As probably you know, as time goes to infinity, as the number of nodes I add grow, goes to infinity, I will eventually, with probability one, if a path exists in my space that gets me from the start to the goal, I'll eventually find it. This is the monkeys of the typewriter approach to finding it, but it's the it's a way to find it. I'll I'll just try every possible stage from every possible action, and I'll eventually get there. Okay, so it's um, natively continuous. Always feasible, and even probabilistically complete. Okay, very, very simple algorithm. Pretty cool things that you can say about it. But there's a problem with this particular algorithm, okay? 
If you start running it, then when Steve and, and James started running it, and they, they wrote this in their paper, um, they would start with some initial state, let's say in the middle of some state space, x1 and x2, or even a, a configuration space if they're just doing kinematic planning. And they'd grow something to the edge, and then they'll pick a point at random, they'll pick a random direction, they'll grow something. And they ended up with a, um, a whole bunch of graph points that were sort of right on top of each other, right? And you'd have you know, a million graph points over here, and it took a really, really long time. If, there, if your goal was over here, it sort of would take a really, really long time to eventually find your way there, right? So this turned out to be, although it's theoretically complete, a completely useless algorithm in practice, okay? That's a caution. Steve Lavelle likes to say that probabilistically completes, complete is sort of an easy property for an algorithm to have, potentially useless, because it could, could take forever to find. So that inspired just a slight tweak on the algorithm, which is called the, what's now famous rapidly exploring random tree, the RRT algorithm. Okay, so let's modify the algorithm. I'll switch slides here. They wanted to take that basic idea and those basic properties of, of organically growing the tree, but do something to, to encourage the tree to grow out into, into space and do some exploration. It's called the RRT algorithm, Rapidly Exploring Random Trees. by um, Kuffner and Laval, circa 2000, okay? RRT algorithm's almost exactly what I just said. You start off with some initial node. I'm gonna just do the, I'm gonna call it the node Q, just to remember that we're gonna, we're not thinking about dynamic constraints yet. We're just thinking about, maybe, let's say, a configuration Space search, okay, so I've got some initial node Q0, and here's my slight modification for the algorithm. I'm going to pick a node at random in my space that I want to explore. On every iteration of the algorithm, I'm going to pick a random seed, okay? Call it Q random. Then I'm going to look at my graph, and I'm going to find the closest point in my graph, um, in my existing graph. At this point, there's only one point, okay? And I'm going to try to grow this in the direction of, of that existing point, okay? So I'll take the, um, the vector on the way there, and I'll grow my, I'll add a node to my graph that sort of moves me along in the direction of that, but I don't want to I want to let it jump arbitrarily dis arbitrary distances, so typically I'll, I'll have some limit on how far it's allowed to grow. And I'll add that node to the graph. And then I'll pick a new node, okay, at random, and I'll try to grow. I'll take the closest point there. I try to grow. If I get something over here, I might grow this way. I might grow down here. Okay, almost exactly this, the same algorithm. The second step is... Which takes me in the direction of, yes. So for a kinematic problem, that's potentially easy. If you don't have constraints on your actions, then it's potentially easy. But that is the crux of what we're going to talk about here, is how would you do something like this if you have dynamics and dynamic constraints? That's the catching part. Good. So you could think of this, um, these random sub-goals. Maybe you could say the big idea here is really that these random, these selected sub-goals are sort of the heuristic which forces you to explore space, right? And 
And really, this is a trivial algorithm um, to implement, but it has a, a few very, very nice properties. So let's just sort of see what it looks like first, right? So. Tell me if the blurring causes a problem, but here's my quick implementation of this random search algorithm. Okay, I'm just going to pick a point at random. This time I'm actually going to go all the way there because I don't have a robot it's attached to. Okay, uh, and look what it does, right? Instead of collapsing in on itself, it grows out. Okay, that's the first thing to notice, but if you watch how it grows out, it's beautiful, right? So um, it has this sort of Fractal-like um, expansion, okay, but even more so, it has this really nice property that it quickly grows out and explores lots of space, and then as the algorithm continues, it sort of goes back and fills in the details, right? And all that came from this sort of three-line trivial algorithm. Was that you get this sort of beautiful, just what you want, explore quickly and then fill in the details kind of algorithm. Okay, it turns out there's, um, there's a way to think about that, which is uh, extremely powerful. Okay? And, it's, and it's by thinking about the, uh, the Voronoi regions of the graph. Okay? Okay, so um, a vor the Voronoi region of a particular point, okay, if I've given a graph, my Voronoi region called the, the ith Voronoi region is the set of all points which by some distance metric are closest to point I, okay? Now, closest requires the, the, some distance metric. And I want it to be the same distance metric that I was talking about on the last slide, which is, you know, I had to somehow, when I picked a random point, I had to find the closest node in the graph, right? So I had some distance metric implied by that. In my example code I just ran, I just used a Euclidean distance, okay? But this, this Voronoi region is sort of the opposite view of that, which is that I'm going to, given the point, let me draw all of, you know, let me call one region, all of the points which, if I were to run this algorithm, would choose me as the closest point, okay? So let's look at the algorithm again, but now from the viewpoint of the Voronoi Regions. Do you have a question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we were, if we, our intention was to go to Q board, why do we need to have a random Q? Why not go way towards Q board directly? Because the, the idea would be if I, um, that's a really good question, and we're going to put some of that goal directed behavior back in. But if you start looking at sort of highly constrained problems with, uh, you know, paths that are non obvious, what there was an inclination that the first thing I need to be able to do is make sure I've explored every possible path through the maze, right? I want some algorithm that's going to encourage me to look at all the different paths in the maze, and any one of them could be the one that gets me there, right? What we're going to do to make them more efficient soon is we're going to start with this random generalization and then sort of pull it, give it some heuristic that pulls it towards the goal, okay, on top of it, and make it goal-directed. But first, we just want to get completeness by looking everywhere, okay? It's a good question. So this Voronoi region is, is maybe the right way to think about why the RRT has this great exploration strategy. So
So here is that same graph growing, but this time I'm drawing the Voronoi regions as it grows. Okay. So one of the things you notice is that the nodes that are on the edge, you, you understand the Voronoi region, right? The, that's the region around which you know, the node is the closest. So this guy's Voronoi region, of course I pick one that's about to get killed, right? Um, this guy is likely to get selected for growth because there's a lot of points in space for which it is the closest point, right? So it has a large Voronoi region. No. Do it again here. And the great thing is when it starts off, the big unexplored regions here have very large Voronoi regions and have a very high probability of being selected for expansion. Okay. Once they filled some, this we've always sampled initially from some bounded space. You know, once those big exploration regions are so are no longer much larger than their neighbors, then the, the guys here that have relatively small Voronoi regions are just as likely to get selected. Of course, what's happening every time is I'm picking something randomly and, and picking, but just the probability of expanding is, is measured by the volume of the Voronoi region, right? And so it really does have this probability of just by, by picking samples at random and growing towards them, of growing out first, and then it's always filling in the details, but sort of the probability of filling in the details being proportional to the Voronoi region, so it gives it this very nice property, okay? grows out and then fills in. So as an exploration-only algorithm, it seems extremely effective, right? And then, just like we asked here, then there's really nice, there's simple ways to extend that um, basic algorithm to actually be goal-directed, right? Um, so you can, to actually arrive at a goal, you can do simple things like adding in a goal bias, right? So I'll, I'll, let's say 90% of the time, I'll pick a point at random from anywhere in state space. But 10% of the time, instead of picking a random point, I'll pick the goal point and try to grow towards the goal, right? sort of a fun way to say it. I'll just, I'll, you know, 10% of the time I'll try to grow directly towards the goal instead of trying to grow towards a random point, okay? And there's a bunch of other little um, games that you can play to make these algorithms really work well at exploring the space, right? So um, another one is bi-directional search, okay? So so if I have a start point and a goal point, you can pick a point at random and sort of grow trees in both directions, both backwards from the goal and forwards from the start. And then it's sort of, instead of having to sort of find a needle in the haystack with the goal, you can, you can just try to, you can find any possible connection between these sort of, these graphs at some point, they'll they'll start lining up and, and touch, and you pick you, with some probability you pick a guy on the neighboring um, on the other tree to connect to. At some point, they'll connect, and this is a really nice way to do um, to do goal directed search is by these bi directional trees. Okay, so there's a there's a grab bag of heuristics, and actually there's a there's a huge literature now on these RRT type algorithms. Um, that have made them very, very effective um, at configuration space um, planning, right? There's a couple other nice properties that they have, right? So they, like, like their predecessor, they're probabilistically complete. That if eventually, if, uh, if a path exists, you will sample it with probability one as time goes to infinity. Um, there's a nice thing, which is that, um, that that the distribution of vertices in your graph 
will actually eventually match the sampling distribution of your initial system. At first, it's very biased towards the initial configurations, but as the number of nodes goes to infinity, it will match the original sampling distribution. Right? And, um, but the thing that made them so successful, I think, is that they're, it's really easy to implement, and it works surprisingly well in surprisingly hard, big problems. Okay, that there, there's really nothing more to it than it, it, it works really well. So, um, so James Kuffner being was one of the, the guys that, that started this, and he started showing people, you know, humanoids um, reaching down and grabbing flashlights under tr under chairs and things like this that were just very high dimensional problems where planning is hard potentially, and and you know, years ago. He's doing, he's generating these surprisingly complex plans. Okay, I think these these were the examples that really made people take notice, and uh, <clears throat> and start picking up on the algorithms. Now it's interesting. We, you know, oh sorry, I hope your hand wasn't up for long. Okay. Uh, so it seems like uh, as this algorithm is running for long, it seems that it becomes hard to find the closest point to the. The, so is, are there any... the cost of the nearest neighbor search can get big. Yeah. That's what you're asking about? Like, like, like when you pick your direction point, then you want to find the closest one to it, right? Exactly. So that right, so, so efficient data structures can help a lot with that, right? You can, people use KD trees and, and other sort of efficient data structures to make that nearest neighbor point query uh, much more effective. I think, you know, Piotr is probably going to give us even better algorithms, sublinear algorithms for doing nearest neighbor search, for instance. I think there's a lot of algorithmic work that can make that very fast. But those data structures, And most of these initial works did actually use Euclidean distance, right? Then it gets harder. Yeah, and that's what we're going to talk about. Yeah. Do they pull the row that hold like 68 degrees of freedom and kind of plan over all joint angles here, or do they like break it up into some problems that they plan over? So it's actually really nice because I can I can tell you sort of the, the details. They're going to this is going to plan in the configuration space, the position space of the robot in the joint space. Okay. Um, it's going to. It's not going to worry about the velocities or, or dynamic constraints of the robot, but using the same zero moment point ideas we talked about before, if they plan a trajectory for these examples, that is, um, if it's moving arbitrarily slowly, the center of mass being over the support polygon is a quasi-static stability constraint. So they'll plan something that they know is quasi quasi statically stable, and then they'll 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 figure out how fast after they found a feasible plan in this high dimensional space. They'll speed it up until the ZMP is in danger of leaving the support polygon. So they use the ZMP um, criteria that this, as, a, as a threshold to tell how fast they can run the, the trajectory back on the real robot. <coughs> so they avoid the dynamic constraints at planning time, but they use them to filter the, the, pl the, run, the playback. Yeah? How easy to load these trees on a mic? It seems to me, for this robot, they try to pick up modifications which are statically stable. Statically stable is not a manifold; it's a volume, right? It's the projection of my center of mass onto the um, region, so it's a, it's it's similar to a, an obstacle-based constraint. If you do have, that's, it's a, um, the, one of the topics in the literature has been, what if you have constraints that are uh, zero, to, you know, cause your 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 feasible space to be lower dimensional than your full space? So, for instance, if I've got, a, you know, if I'm constrained to have my hand on the table and I want to somehow do something like this. And there's clever sampling strategies where you try to sample from the low dimensional space, or you sample from the high dimensional space and project down to the lower dimensional space. And you, it's hard to get a uniform sampling distribution in some cases, but but there's there's people that have there's lots of literature now on people that have extended these to that kind of constrained um, planning. Yeah. You said it's just that the approach to actually apply that on the on the robot is not necessarily slower than so it's cause cause side to scale. Sort of the opposite. Plan something that that, that yeah at, at zero velocity is st is stable, and then speed it up until the ZMP is at the boundary. Like this plan here with the same item that would be apt for trajectory optimization. So uh, sitting next to Andres yesterday, I watched him plan. I actually told him I was going to show this video today, and so he whipped he whipped out and did trajectory optimization for Atlas to go down and pick something up under the table, just to, just to remind me that that's that's part of the story. Um, and so I think we can, for this, we can do tra trajectory optimization. The rub is that 
there's a chance that our trajectory optimization will return saying, I couldn't find a solution, right? So the difference is, I think our trajectory optimization will find a locally optimal trajectory faster than our T, um, but could fail, right? So maybe one thing to do would be to put those two tools together. Um, could, I, I guess in, in translating this to, you know, a real physical system, would, I guess like, you know, you'd have a plan, you'd have some trajectory, but would kind of backup systems be necessary to still stabilize the robot, um, like control for stabilization, and I guess some kind of visual or tactile feedback for actually fully grasping it? Um, Absolutely, yes. This is still just an open loop trajectory at best. In fact, it's a discontinuous one, the one that comes out almost, and it's probably got jaggies and, and stuff like this, right? So almost everybody will do a smoothing pass, if nothing else, before they play it back. Uh, anybody who's doing a dynamic task will put a feedback controller on top of it. For grasping, um, it actually stops right before he touches the, the, the flashlight. <laughs> and that's that's uh, because it's hard to go through. Yeah? So that looks like a fairly optimal trajectory, and RRT is, is, doesn't provide optimal trajectories. Oh, is this just lag, or did it do anything in particular to you? We'd have to ask James for the right answer, but my guess is there were another bunch of trajectories that didn't look so pretty, right? So there's, there, uh, you know, there are people that will joke about, you know, hey, my robot's doing ROTs, you know, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, uh, so that can happen. It's, it's a pro you know, um, but, you know, it'll always find something if it exists, you know, as time goes to infinity. Um, all right, so, so the big question that I want to I talk about here is um, what happens if now our system is a, oh, yeah. Sorry, just before we move on, yeah. you didn't explicitly talk about what to do about obstacles. I just want to make sure I'm thinking about that. Good. I, I did jump over that because I was thinking more about the dynamics. But so, um, and we're going to talk about it uh, more here. But um, in the algorithm I get, just gave you, so um, pick a random sample. Check if it's inside an obstacle. If it is, throw it away. Uh, and then, and the other thing you have to do is when I'm extending to it, I make sure the point I'm extending to doesn't end up inside an obstacle. We basically just throw away samples, and that turns out to be a very effective way to sample from the configuration free, the the, the obstacle free space, is just rejection sampling. Good question. Okay, so I mean I think that's great because um, this is something that the computer science robotics people have have really embraced. But what I want to talk about is that I think it's very relevant for dynamics, too. If we can solve some of the potential pitfalls of, you know, all these questions that you're having about um, what does it take to, to do this growth in, in a dynamical system. So let me just show you an example. Let's just apply, apply the vanilla algorithm to, um, to the pendulum, okay? Oh, by the way, I, I forgot to show... Um, you know, these things really do have the probabilistic completeness. Let me show the, the canonical one that you'll run in uh, your problem set here. But so here's the bug trap. Okay, you got to get your your start to the goal here, and you're stuck in a uh, in a in a room with only a small exit. And trajectory optimization would have a very hard time getting out of there. But eventually, with some probability, you'll sample a point that gets you through. Okay, and we'll find a path to the goal. So that's really the nice show showpiece for um, for probabilistic completeness. Okay, so let's do exactly the same algorithm, but let's do it now on the pendulum. So um, so we're going to pick a point at random. We're going to find the closest point in our graph, and now what do we do to, to extend? We're going to try to find look at look for the torque that's going to get me as close as possible to the to the solution to the random um, sample. Okay, sure. All right, so here it goes. So you can see it's expanding only dynamically feasible things. You can see the eyeball emerging. You can also see a lot. Actually, that one didn't even finish. Yeah, it's, it's, it, when I ran this in, prep, in preparation, there were a few times it, it solved like just like that. I don't know if it happens in class. I'm not going to even make the point I'm trying to make. But this is the worst I've seen. It actually uh, didn't find anything before I said it was a ridiculous number of samples. There we go. Let's try again. So with some probability, oh, look at that, look how fast that one was, right? Um, 
All right, so you know, depending on your, how lucky you are, right, you might take a ridiculous number of samples to find a path. You might take a few samples if you got really lucky. This one was somewhere in between, okay? But it does find a path to the goal if it exists, right? And if you give it enough samples. The problem is if you watch this thing growing, it's excruciating to watch, right? Because here's what happens. It'll pick a point at random. It'll expand this node in the tree. It'll grow to here, okay? And then it'll pick some other point at random. It'll pick the same node. It'll add the same point back into the tree, right? You'll, you'll pick another point at random, and there's just no chance that, it's, that this, this is the closest point in the tree, um, right? But it's still going to try to grow from here. And it's just, it's just horribly, ridiculously inefficient, okay? Um, because basically there's three steps in the algorithm, right? The three steps in the algorithm were, um, you know, choose an initial... Um, point, right? Basically, I, you know, I have to. Um, I've got three steps in my algorithm. One is choose a random point, and to some extent, um, picking uniform random points as a way to pull my tree around. It just feels broken for dynamical systems, right? So, um, you know, I think I think for dynamical systems, we really need better sampling distributions. It just feels like I'm always picking points that are not the ones I places that's going to let me grow, right? Do separate sampling distribution. Second point is, the second thing is, find the closest point on my graph. And the notion of using a Euclidean distance just is painful. It's painfully wrong for the dynamical systems, right? Right, if I look at the pendulum, and I've got some, um, some nodes like this on my, my graph. There's sort of an obvious problem, right? If I, pick, if I pick a random sample like this, and I decide that this is going to be my closest point, there's no way I can go from here to here. The, ol the only way I can get from here to here is to go all the way around the circle and get there, right? Whereas this guy, he's a little bit farther away, but maybe he has a chance of going there. Or maybe he, even he doesn't. Maybe the right point is, is someplace back here, right? So the notion of being close in Euclidean distance is not a good metric for closeness in a dynamical system, right? Certainly even, even the face um, space, sort of the, 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 second, the fact that it's a second order system gives you an obvious you have to go around the circle sort of problem. But the further dynamic constraints about torque limits and other things, they just, they just add to the constraints and make, it imp make that notion of distance wrong, okay? And then, um, and then the, the notion that, like Pat asked, is, you know, uh, choose an action U to extend the tree. And again, we have to do something a little bit more for dynamical systems because it's not clear how you should extend the tree to get as close to this random sample as possible. We have to somehow interrogate our dynamics, right? So we need better extend operators. For the dynamical systems case. Now, Unfortunately, what I can give you, I can give you a bunch of ideas for each of those topics. Unfortunately, there's, they're not a hard science right now. I'd say this is a, I can give you a grab bag of tricks and heuristics that people have come up with. Some of them are effective, some of them need work. Um, but, but we're still sort of in the space of clever tricks and things that work, um, you know, your mileage may vary, right? Um, I think there's, there's good work to be done still in trying to resolve these problems for dynamical systems. 
right? And it's not, uh, it's not necessarily um, coming up with algorithms that interrogate my dynamical system to really expose the distance perfectly. We know how to do that, like value iteration would do that for us, but we can't afford to run that all the time, right? So there's some trade-off that to make these algorithms really effective, there's some trade-off, there's some magical place where you think a lot about your dynamics, um, but also do it quickly enough to make it an efficient algorithm. And that's, that's right now a black magic. Okay. All right, so let's dig in a little bit and see um, see some of the tricks people have been do using to make these things work in dynamical systems. All right, so the first one on that list was um, sampling distributions. Let's see if we can think about changing the sampling distribution to possibly behave better for a dynamical system. <clears throat> So the idea um, in the configuration space, the way you should be thinking about the, the initial sampling distribution that we're using in the configuration space problem is if I have some obstacles, in my space, okay, what I'd like to do is come up uh, with a probability distribution that gives me, let's say, a uniform sampling over the configuration-free regions of the space. I'd like to uniformly sample from the free space. Right? So how do I write down a distribution which gives me samples exactly in this free space? That's really hard. I don't actually write that down. Okay. But there's a very simple idea, which I've already mentioned now, but um, which allows me to generate samples uniformly over that space. And the idea is rejection sampling. So I can generate uniformly random samples. from the free space by sampling at random from the whole space, checking to see if it's in collision, and simply throwing away the points that are in collision. The points that are left are going to be a uniform, uniformly distribution, distributed across the free space. Right? Okay, so that's the story that has played out beautifully in the kinematic planning, in the uh, humanoid reaching under the table and the moving a piano through a 3D environment, and sort of some of the, the kinematic motion planning problems. Can we take that same sampling, rejection sampling idea, and make it work for dynamical systems? What would be a good distribution, let's say, for the pendulum, right? If I've got some initial trajectories like this, is there a way to somehow, you know, what would I like to have? I'd like to have that the sampling distribution was somehow, you know, the reachable space of the pendulum maybe, right? I'd like to somehow sample from, from different places where it's possible to, you know, I'd like to somehow sample from the reachable set of the pendulum, right? That would sort of, can't prove that it's ideal, but intuitively to me that feels like the points that we'd like to generate samples from. So 
how can we do that? Um, there's actually beautiful work on reachability analysis for nonlinear systems, right? Um, they, they're very well connected to the Lyapunov analysis that we talked about before. You can, you can sort of do an analysis forward in time, like the, like the Lyapunov analysis, and find reachable regions. Um, but all that's very expensive, and probably not the thing you want to throw right in the middle of your fast explore everything algorithm, right? So what people have tried to do is, is come up with really simple heuristics that can capture some of the properties of a reachable region, but be maybe embrace this rejection sampling idea and, uh, uh, and be fast enough to make it really useful. So here's one algorithm. Which is called the reachability guided. RRT. This is one of many. I just get to pick a few. I have, this is one that my student did. I just spelled his name wrong. Sorry, Alec. Okay, and so, so Alex's idea was, and, and this is a nice example, I think, just because it gives you a sense of the, the trade-off between trying to come up with numerically clever things and um, sort of dynamically sensible things, right? So Alex's idea was, I'm going to build two trees, okay? One of them is going to be the tree that I that I. I grew initially the initial RRT, the basic RRT. Plus this reachability, the reachable set approximation tree. Okay, so every time he adds a node to, this, to the tree, he has a, some node into his tree. He's going to add a couple extra nodes to the reachable tree by basically trying to delineate the maximum. Think of it in one dimension, one actuator space. Let's say he applies u max to get one set of the reachable set and u min. to get another um, the other extreme of his reachable set, okay? And he'll just add these two points to the reachable set tree, okay? And then the algorithm was very simple. He's gonna pick a point at random anywhere in the space. Find the closest point on either tree. And basically, if the node, if the closest node is on the reachable tree, then we're going to add the parent and try to grow back out. That means you found some node where there was reachable space that you hadn't yet explored. If the node was on an existing tree, then he's just going to discard it and keep going. Okay, so his goal was to, you know, if I get a sample like this, I'm going to just throw that out. If I get a sample like this, it's closer to here, so I'm going to try to grow this here. And if I overlap, if a, tr if a node moves from my reachable um, set to my basic RRT, I'll, I'll take it out of the reachable set tree, okay? So the idea was to somehow shadow, you know, with, with a few points, the reachable set and only grow the tree when the reachable set gave me evidence that there was room to grow in that direction.
Now, I hope that you're highly suspicious of that idea. I was highly suspicious of that idea. Um, it works really, really well, okay? Um, at least in this, in this simple examples. For, uh, let me try to sh show a few of them. And it has some of the properties that, that you might like. So first of all, um, here's the pendulum again, just centered a little differently. This is the basic RRT. This is his reachability guided RRT. This one's already done. It's been done, actually. This one's still growing. But the point is that it sort of not surprisingly comes up with a much more sparse tree. It expands many less nodes because it's only pulling out when it thinks it has room to grow it. It rejects a lot of samples. But it pulls the tree, especially sort of for the, in these bang bang control site solutions, it pulls the tree very effectively towards the goal. And he drew these backwards also and, and did this. But the reason that it seems to work is the Voronoi story um, that you can, you can tell for this algorithm too, right? So this is the Voronoi regions. The green regions are the, is the Voronoi regions of the, the reachability tree. And the gray are the ones where the closest point is on the original tree. So Alex's view of this was that um, basically this is a dynamic Voronoi bias where the Voronoi region is always moving and it's staying sort of in the shadow of in the places that I want to be able to pull my tree to, right? Does that make sense? Just by virtue, the, the region is colored green if it is the Voronoi region of a point on the pink tree, which is the reachability tree. It's colored gray if it's, if it's going to be rejected by this algorithm. Okay? So this is just a simple heuristic way to make my samples come from places where I still have some room to grow by my reachability estimate. So I think, uh, so yes, and, uh, and that's why I was most suspicious of it. But he's, I'll, I'll show you his best examples of making this work for really high dimensional systems. Um, but I think there's, um, there's a lot of hope for that. So for instance, for the control affine systems, the reachable set for one time step is going to be a polytope, right? I think there's a lot of nice work to be done sort of on, on, on effective algorithms for approximating that reachable set and combining with cleverness of the Voronoi regions. Um, and I'd say this was the first crack at it that worked pretty well. Okay, so um, this, was, this was Alex's uh, sort of hallmark example was our little dog robot. It's a dynamic uh, robot with a total of 14 state variables. The problem formulation was you start here, you need to get to a goal over here. The dynamic constraints were physics, right? With equations in motion, okay? And there's these obstacles in the world like this. He did a couple things to make this tractable. One of them was this reachability guided RRT. He also did sampling in the task space of the robot. So he, he picked, he had a primitive, which was this half bound sort of primitive. And he chose samples that were sort of in the, center of mass location of this half bound primitive. So he did a, a smarter sampling thing too. But my gosh, if it didn't, I mean the reachability, when he started sort of taking out the different pieces, the one that seemed sort of the most important was this, like, this notion of, of reachability, that he basically quickly discarded um, samples that had the robot tip over and fall down, quickly discarded samples that had the robot nosedive into the ground. And just doing that made this random search in an extremely high dimensional space uh, you know, carve out these beautiful trajectories uh, on, on big, complicated robot, right? Now, so I, I, think, I think there's probably a, a, a pure answer somewhere in the middle, uh, you know, between this, but it was, it was a reminder for me that, that the sort of the algorithmic cleverness really can pay off in a big way. There's another big advantage of this. This is a hybrid system, right? So the other big advantage, I think the big idea in the reachability-guided um, RRT was that you're really using, you're not looking at the current point in the tree, but you're somehow simulating for one step and using the points where you can get to in a step as my, the point I'm looking for. So for a hybrid system view of the world, right, one of the problems with growing RRTs for hybrid systems was that 
if I pick a point at random over here, or if I pick a point at random over here, I'm never, it's sort of impossible to imagine, well, not impossible, but it's, it's hard to imagine a, a nice distance metric that's going to cause me to say, I've got a random sample over here, let me pick the point that's close here and grow it across this um, boundary, right? To some extent, the, in the hybrid systems view of the world, this is sort of a black hole that I don't know how to go across, uh, except for my reset, I've got this discontinuous dynamics getting me across. So, so how would I ever come up with a smooth distance metric that's gonna tell me to go grow like this? And Alex's solution was that at the time I add the node to the tree, I'm gonna go ahead and project forward its samples, right? And by looking at the closest point, if I have my random sample here, I, by looking at the, the reachable point, the one step reachable point, right? It tells me I should grow from back here to get close to it. So I think the idea of looking, building the tree one step ahead is a very powerful idea. Okay, that's, just, that's idea number one. Here's idea number two. Let's think about, um, I, I, I've decided to try to give one idea for each of the, the obvious problems, which is that you have a seemingly wrong sampling distributions or let's say opportunities for improvement. You can make the sampling distribution better. The second one was let's make the distance metric better. Let's see if we can somehow come up with a, a, a way to think about distance for a dynamical system, right? Yeah. True, right? So you, because you're looking at the one step ahead region, so it does also change the distance. Yeah, that's true. They're all related, obviously. Yeah. Okay, so um, so the big challenge here is how do I somehow come up with a distance metric? And I think you know the pendulum is a perfectly good way to to think of it. You know, if I have if I pick a point here, how do I somehow decide that the, the point, if I, my random sample is here, how do I somehow decide that the point I want to expand from is way back here? And not here, for instance, because I'd have to go all the way around the tree. Right? Well, how can we possibly come up with a dynamic distance? So, distance metrics a proper distance metric has many properties, right? Um, it should be positive, it should be symmetric, it should be have a triangle inequality. But you know, our dynamic distance, well, let's, let me write those down, right? So a proper distance metric say the distance between two points x and y right it should have positivity right it should be that dxy should be greater than 0 except for dxx should be equal to 0 sorry that should be positive Should be symmetric. And the last one is the triangle inequality, right? Should satisfy the triangle inequality. So that's a problem, right? I mean, the proofs of, for instance, um, convergence, you know, uh, to the, of the sampling distribution and the like for the RRT depend on these properties, right? And that's a problem. I think, for instance, the the distance metric that's suitable for a dynamical system will never be symmetric, right? So, for instance, you know, this 
point might be, this might be close if I'm going from here to here, but it's very far if I'm going the other way. So I think it's a, it's an open and interesting question about, you know, first of all, what is the right distance metric? And second of all, are we okay if that distance metric is not symmetric? And what does that imply on the, the proofs? I think the asymmetry doesn't actually break the algorithm probably, but the proofs would have to be revised. Okay, so what would you imagine? What are some ideas you could throw out there about distance metric for this thing? Maybe, I mean, you took the path integral between the two points uh, for the so how am I going to get the natural trajectory? So, so I've got, a, I've got, and the other thing you have to do, you have to do it for every possible point on the tree. That's true. Well, so you have the two points. You have your, I guess, the point you want to get to and the point you're starting at. Okay. Uh, and you know the differential equation, like, that determines how it behaves. And you can draw, like, a straight line between the two. You can say, oh, the, the vector field is, like, aligned or not aligned. Is there a solution that contains that line, basically? Yeah. yeah. So I think I think something like that could potentially work, but you but you have to make it efficient enough to check every possible point all the time, right? And I don't know if that would be a good one or not. What are some other ideas people have? Okay, so that again implies that implies somehow finding the path. So I, if I if I run if I'm willing to run trajectory optimization from every initial condition or something like that, I could do it. Actually, I, I don't you know. I think there's versions of that that aren't created that are that are possible definitely. But I think that the by by itself is is hard. Yeah. That looks close to the upper part. So if I had somehow um, a Lyapunov function for the system that would tell me if I had a controller that I wrote locally, let's say, that could get me back to the system, and I looked at the value of a Lyapunov function, I like that idea a lot, right? Something like that could work. And that would, that would require somehow computing a priori the Lyapunov function. And actually, that's one that, that I, uh, I, can, I can talk about. Let's go, I mean, so more generally, if I have... Um, if I have a the Apinoff function or you know a cost to go function for maybe like the minimum time because you're talking about actuator effort or some some effort like that, if I could somehow come up with a surrogate cost for getting there, like your like your your actuator effort or the Apinoff analysis, then that would be a great distance metric, right? So I think uh, Steve Lavelle uh, of the RRT, you know, would would say that maybe the ideal distance metric would be cost to go function, let's say for the minimum time problem, okay? Something like, or minimum actuator effort, right? So that's right between what your, your two suggestions were. Um, and so, and since that is hard to compute, or if I, let's say rather, if I've already computed that, then I probably wouldn't need to do an RRT because I've already solved the problem to completion. The name of the game is gonna be, how can I somehow approximate that, come up with an approximate Lyapunov function or cost to go that I could use, that I could compute cheaply, that might be enough to guide my search but not so expensive to compute. Yeah. So, uh, you're going to get the resulting energy? I think you could. I think if, I think for the pendulum example, I bet I think you can use energy to somehow as a distance. I, I, I very much like that idea. Yeah. Other ideas in the space would be, um, uh, let's say, linearize here and solve a, an LQR problem which you could solve. You maybe solve it once every time you add your node to the tree and use the, the LQR cost to go as my distance metric locally. You have a time varying aspect of that, so it's not the trivial LQR case, it's the more complicated LQR case. But we, we've, we've tried that before, that can work. 
But actually, um, my favorite one is um, is an example by Emilio Frizzoli, which you know Emilio writes very technical papers, so there's not a lot of pictures I can show you there. But uh, um, you know, he's he back in 2002 took some RRT type algorithms and did real time motion planning for. Uh, a, a helicopter moving through a dynamic environment. Okay, and the plots that I I can show are sort of these these smooth, um, nice trajectories. Which, compared to my pendulum example, this is a very nice sparse tree that he somehow managed to grow in in the um, state space of the helicopter. So how did he do it? Okay, so his idea was that the helicopter and uh, since I'm running out of time, I'll just use my hands. Okay, but uh, the helicopter's dynamics, in if when you're con when there's no obstacles in the world, are relatively low dimensional. Okay, so in some trim condition, he's actually going to go ahead and discretize and solve do value iteration to come up with a cost to go function for the the helicopter dynamics in the low dimensional space. Okay. Doing that for every configuration in an obstacle environment would be intractable. But he used, his idea was to use the, the cost to go from the value iteration of the obstacle-free helicopter as the distance metric when you now put obstacles back in the environment. Okay? And the reason that worked was because there's some trivial invariance in the helicopter dynamics, which is that if I can compute if I have a trim condition of my helicopter pointing this way, and I solve this to you know the cost to go to get to that configuration from every point, then I can easily compute the uh, cost to go of the helicopter pointing this way because of there's just rotational symmetries in that. The dynamics don't change as a function of theta; they don't change as a function of x and y. So if I just solve sort of for one trim condition or a few trim conditions, if I want the more dynamic cases, a few dynamic programming problems for the obstacle-free case then that gives me a heuristic that I can use for the obstacle-based case. Okay? So that's, a, that's maybe my favorite example of, of a, using a distance metric, a clever distance metric, but I think you know, the LQR kind of stuff works too. I think there's, um, there's lots of good work to be, to be done there. And then one we'll talk about later is I do think trajectory optimization can be filled in. I, I put that in my three possible opportunities to improve the RRT better sampling distribution, better distance metric. I actually think that better extend operation, salt, using trajectory optimization, if I pick a random point, even if it's not a, you know, if I pick a random point, I pick my closest point, how do I choose my action to get me there? I think trajectory optimization has an important role to play there to, to find some solution, even if it's potentially far away, so that I can recover even from a, a very bad choice of my closest distance. And we'll get back to that in, the, in another lecture. Yeah? What would happen if you put in the solution from RRT into your trajectory optimization? That's the perfect thing to do. I think so, you know, people will just do, a lot of RRT people will just smooth it with some Gaussian sort of filter, but I think the right thing to do for a problem like this would be to take, use the RRT to be a feasible initial guess that finds a path through the maze and then throw it as, a, that as the initial guess to a trajectory optimization to clean it up. Right on, right on the money. Yeah? Uh, what's the name of that paper? It's, uh, it's, if you search for RRT, Laval and Kuffner. Oh, the way this one? Oh, uh, yeah. This is a, uh, there you go. Um, and also, I guess so for that, um, so kind of, for this one, for the helicopter flying through at like, you know, constant trim condition and then anything, the distance metric for point would be how far away from that trim condition you need to move. Um, would that, I, I guess going back to the pendulum, would that kind of be some, say, like, pseudo-momentum vector, like within the... Uh, it can be better than that, right? So so I agree, but it, it, but it could encode whatever cost function you, you care about. So it could have energy type components, it could have other, you know, it's, it depends on your on your dynamics plus your, just your cost function. Thanks, I'll see you Thursday. <laughs>